Now this place, 665 Berendo, which is just off of Melrose. We're actually over in kind of East Hollywood right now. This used to be, I guess years ago, a recording studio, but it was a, a rehearsal studio by the time Dave and I found the place. And it was a place called Mars Studios. And I actually worked here for a short while because we were so broke and needed somehow to make some money. So I actually worked here for a little while. And a guy named Hanley actually gave me a job here, which was great because then after hours and off the books, I could kind of slide Megadeth in and we could do some free rehearsals here, which was great. And uh, actually, we did a lot of rehearsing here with Gar Samuelson. We uh, did a lot of writing, I think, for Killing Is My Business here. And Chris Poland did a lot of rehearsing here with us as well. Because there was a phase where Chris was playing with us when we were recording Killing Is My Business, and then he bailed out of the band for a while, and then he came back in for a bit. And uh, that's why he didn't do the tour for Killing Is My Business. Another guy by the name of Mike Albert did. And then Chris came back in, and that was when we, we continued on and through the Peace Cells era with both Chris and Gar. So this place, man, what a dump. This place was dilapidated, but man, we did a lot of partying, did a lot of songwriting, and a lot of jamming here. It was cool. The session's edgy, angry sound was on raw display in Megadeth's debut album, Killing Is My Business, and Business Is Good. Released in May of 85, the record got good reviews in both metal and mainstream rock magazines. While the music was a tour de force, the album's artwork was more of a joke. Somewhere we fucked up the artwork. We lost the artwork. And it caused the major to do. David wanted an illustration of his own creation, Vic Rattlehead, to adorn the cover of the album. But the label had another idea. The first album cover was not the way we wanted it. It's a plastic skull with tin foil on it and bones with pickles and ketchup on it. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, boy, did we get cheated. The first thing I thought of was low budget. But the title made up for everything. With an album to support, Megadeth began peeling the paint from concert venues from coast to coast. The early days, we didn't have any place to live. So going on the road was great. We finally had a place to live. You know, and I remember like looking at the itinerary or something and going, oh man, the tour's going to end. Now what am I going to do? Now who am I going to go back to L.A. and live with? During the next four years, they would rarely come off the road. We'd be driving around the country in a motorhome. Doing heroin and coke every day. And just psycho. You know, we're out of our minds and, and playing clubs. Smoking pot every day and drinking every day. We never went to sleep. It was, we just passed out. It's like the closest four guys ever get to each other without actually having sex with each other. But if the band provoked hysteria in the heavy metal underground, they provoked horror in the world above. We'd pull into truck stops and Gar would go in and buy like pickled pig's feet and a couple of beers. You would go into some of these little podunk redneck truck stops and they kind of look at you like you're the devil incarnate and, and then they ask you who you are. Chris gets funny with them and he goes, oh, we're a, a gospel act. I go, Megadeth. And they'd be, Megadeth. Ah. And uh, you just go, oh my God, they're going to be waiting for us outside with pitchforks right now. Parents criticized Megadeth for their hellacious looks and violent lyrics. But the music hit a nerve with America's disenfranchised youth. I was a 13-year-old kid. It's everything you're looking for because you're so pissed off at the world. You know what I mean? It just empowers you. I mean, it's just, it's just powerful music. They were truly angry. Truly angry young men. By the spring of 86, Megadeth was developing a national reputation. Still, it paled next to that of Metallica. They were leaving us behind. They were taking off. They were doing really good. And it was burning me up, you know? He hated everything. He hated himself. He hated me. He hated the company. He felt that he could not break through unless he was on a major label. The band's debut album had sold 100,000 copies, a decent tally for an independent label release, but not good enough for Dave Mustaine. He was just like... Like a rabid dog, man. He would just be like, ar, ar. We said, hey, it's a process. We're, we're growing up together. But he felt that we couldn't get him to the next level. So there was a tremendous anxiety between label and band and Dave. The last thing we wanted to do was sell Megadeth. But he was in a mode of denial that was kind of scary. 